right, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. This is our ninth week uh, together in the book of Ephesians. We are just, uh, we've, I've called it uh, taking a walk through Ephesians, and that's kind of what we're doing. We're just strolling through it, and we are uh, looking at God's Word as the, as the Lord leads, as the Holy Spirit leads each week. And so we have skipped around in Ephesians, and I think God's teaching us a lot of things. Like I said, we spent a week talking about the Holy Spirit. We've spent some time talking about what it means to be the church, uh, what the church is supposed to be doing. And this morning, the, the title of the sermon is Living in the Light. The Lord just uh, led me toward this uh, little passage of Scripture in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. And so let's look at it together, and then we'll begin to break it down this morning and see what the Lord wants to teach us uh, through His Word. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Here's what it says. Uh, it says, For at one time... You were darkness, but now, now that you're a believer, this is speaking to believers, it says, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that's good and right and true. And verse 10 says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That, that, should be our, that should be our waking up and living and our going to sleep every day as believers. If you have come to life in Christ... We, we weren't saved by works. We weren't saved by what we could do to please the Lord. There's nothing we can do to please the Lord to make us saved. We're saved by grace through what? Faith. We're saved by grace through faith. But once we become a believer, that's what verse 10 says we're supposed to be doing as believers. Try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. Verse 11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything's exposed by the light, it becomes visible. And the last verse we're going to look at this morning, I love this verse. Some of you will remember um, several months ago, Michael Pugh, uh, who used to be on staff here at our church, one of our church members, he preached for me one Sunday. He preached on this particular verse, and it says, For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So as we get to this, this, this passage, here's kind of the way I want to back into this this morning. I want us to realize that Ephesians chapter 5, as Paul is writing this letter, uh, y'all talk to me here, who, this, this is real easy. We, we ought to get an A on this. Who was Paul writing this letter to? The church at Ephesus. He was writing to these believers in Ephesus. Y'all are awesome. Um, so he's, he's writing this letter, and if you read through it, uh, there's a lot of doctrinal stuff in the first three chapters. Four, five, and six begins to be the practical stuff. Here's how you live out your faith. And so chapter five, if you really break it down, if you really spend some time there, you're going to realize that the whole chapter Paul is talking about change. It, it's designed, this chapter, this is what I believe as I, as I read it. it. Paul was writing this, it's designed to teach us that if we are Christians, then we are supposed to be different than the world around us. And since we are different, we should live lives that are different. And the simple, the simple truth of the matter is, is that believers should be different than those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, and I don't mean for that to sound imperialistic or selfish or, um, or prideful when I say that believers are supposed to be different than people who don't know Christ. But I just simply mean that we are different now, aren't we? We're different now that we know Christ. We were lost, but we're not lost anymore. We were without hope at one time, but guess what we have now? We have hope, don't we? We, we, we didn't know Christ, but now we know Christ. We were going to go to hell because of our sin, but because of what Christ has done for us, and because we came to faith in Christ because of His grace, we're not going to go to hell anymore. We have eternity with Christ. So if you really, really, really know Jesus Christ, your life is different now. A Christian, we talked about this. Uh, we talked about this over the last couple of weeks a little bit. A Christian now has the Holy Spirit living inside of you. I'm a believer. I have the Holy Spirit living in my soul, and 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 so do you if you know Christ. Paul Paul talked about this in every letter that he wrote. Listen to what he said to the church at Corinth as he was writing in Corinthians and First Corinthians. He said in First Corinthians two twelve. He said, "Now we have received not the Spirit." of the world, 
but the Spirit who is from God. He said, we, we're not of the world anymore. We've received the Spirit who's from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Aren't you, aren't you thankful this morning that God, out of His grace, freely gave us life in Christ? So as we read Ephesians chapter 5, where we are this morning, Paul is saying things about change, like he did in chapter 5, verse 1. He said, we're commanded to live like God. If you read verse 2, he says, we're commanded to begin to love like God. To, to love other people because Christ has loved us. We won't love other people unless we really understand that Christ loved us first. It's hard to love other people sometimes, but you do it because Christ loved you. And why? Because, like I've been saying, we're different now. We're in relationship with Christ. Christ has redeemed us. He's bought us. Remember we talked about it last week. He's brought us out of slavery, and he's freed us. We're in right relationship with him. He, and this week, he, he, we talk about he has made us light. Let me, let me give you something to help you see it maybe in a different way than you ever thought about before. This is kind of interesting. Go with me here. Go with me, uh, just, just this thought in the Old Testament here for just a second. You can, you, you can turn there and kind of scan it. I'm not really going to read much scripture from there, but I don't want to talk to you. In, in the book of Hosea, one of the very first messages that I preached at Crosshaven uh, we weren't even on this property yet. We were the church, for those of you that don't know, the first year and a half or so that this church existed, we, we met in the Hansville National Guard Armory, which is a pretty cool thing to talk about on Memorial Day. God provided a place for us to meet in the early days that this church existed. Um, and it was cool. We met in the National Guard Armory. And, and I can remember we preached through Hosea. And, um, and if you know anything about Hosea, you understand that Hosea was an Old Testament prophet. That's what Hosea was. And he, uh, in other words, he, in the Old Testament times, he spoke truth to the people as God led him to do that. And, and Hosea also gave a lot of insight into what was about to come about at some point in time with Christ. Um, he, and so Hosea, let's, let's just say it like this, Hosea was a spiritual leader in Israel. But God made a very, very unusual, and I want you to go here with me for just a second. We're going to come full circle. God made a very unusual kind of request to Hosea. And I want you to get this. This is really weird. God tells Hosea, I'm not kidding, this is in the Bible. God tells Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. Now, you're like, is that in the Bible? Yeah, God told Hosea to go and marry a, a prostitute. Her name was Gomer. Long story short, Hosea obeys God, and he goes and marries Gomer. And eventually, Gomer goes back to prostitution, back to having affairs, back to sexual promiscuity, even though they were married. In fact, if you read chapter 2 of Hosea, it says, and this is what the Bible says, in chapter 2 of Hosea, it says that she had played the whore and acted shamefully. You're like, I bet I didn't know I was going to hear that at church this morning. But you did, okay? <laughs> but here's the cool thing about this story in Hosea. You see this great story of redemption come about. Because here's what happens. Hosea goes and seeks Gomer out and buys her back out of prostitution because she was his wife. He goes and buys back, get this, what was already his. Think about salvation. God made you and God made me. God made us. We were made in his image. We are his. Yet we are the prostitute. You're like, I didn't know I was going to hear that at church this morning. I didn't know the pastor was going to call me a prostitute. I'm calling myself that too. We are the prostitute. We sinned. We turned on God. We ran away. We found other lovers. Yet think about what God did. He paid the highest ransom possible for people that he made and loves. He paid and bought back what was already his. And when you come to grips with that fact... And you are moved into relationship with Jesus Christ. It changes you. Gomer was redeemed. And if you're a Christian this morning, 
you are a part of the family of God. You are a part of the redeemed. God's people are redeemed by Christ, aren't we? When you surrender your ways and your life, and you admit your sin before God, and you call upon God to save you, then you move from darkness and death, and you move into life and light. So, if you're a Christian now, I know I've said it 27 billion times this morning, if you're a Christian now, your life is different. And if you're not, you don't need to spend another second without knowing Christ. Don't play around with life. So, we're in Ephesians chapter 5, and leading up to where he where we are today, you see in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7, that we're commanded to leave the ways of this world behind. And, and we get to verse 8, and Paul begins to talk about being light. And here's the deal. We're still living in the world, aren't we? He, Paul, it, It's kind of a hard request, because Paul is saying, don't be like the world, but you've got to live in it for a while. And, and it's kind of this weird dynamic when you are a part of something, but you're not supposed to be a part of it, right? But then you're supposed to be a part of it, and you're supposed to figure out what God's telling us with all that. I'm in the world, but I'm not supposed to be part of its ways. And, and then it can be kind of weird if you're, if you're not grounded in Christ, because it, maybe you're a believer and you've come to know Christ, but you're struggling, like I talked about when I prayed earlier, and you're struggling in, in sin. And you get caught in this middle ground that is not good because the Bible, called, Jesus called it being lukewarm. Claiming to be one thing, I'm a believer, but really living like another. And Jesus had very strong words for it. And at the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, here's, here's what, as John wrote this scripture, here, here's what he said. This is... A, quote of Christ he said so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold I will spit you out of my mouth that's what Jesus thinks about this lukewarm state of this back and forth and where my loyalty lies and, and who, who, who I am I'm, I'm saying I'm one thing but my life is proving that I'm living another and, and, I, and I think that that's why these writers in the New Testament people like Paul and you saw Peter do it and you, you see the gospel writers doing it that's why they emphasized over and over and over and over again. It's like over and over in different ways they're saying to believers, hey, don't forget who you are now. And they're all doing it in different ways and they're saying it, but it all comes back. They're saying, hey, if you're a believer, don't forget who you are. You've been purchased with a price. You've been redeemed. You're light now. You're, you're a city on a hill. You're different than you used to be. You used to be one way, but now you're another. you you're not your own anymore. You're a child of the king. Don't forget that. You're not in charge of your life anymore. Remember, you surrendered your rights so that you could be saved. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He said, we are strangers and pilgrims now that we are saved. So we need to constantly remember every day. If you're a believer, you need to remember, I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim, I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim. Sometimes when I'm on the ball field and I'm coaching, I'm very competitive. I have to say, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to yell at this referee, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian. And I still got a technical one time because I asked the referee very nicely. I said, hey man, are you sure you're watching the same game I'm watching? Because it doesn't seem like you are. I said it really nice, and he was like, that'll be a technical foul. In fact, we were playing your team about three years ago, I see it. and he was over there laughing, they ended up winning. There was a time when we lived like the world, and we had no hope, right, believers? There was a time when we thought like the world, because that's who we were. And because we were a part of it. But when we were saved by the grace of God, listen to me this morning, church, we were delivered from our old life of sin, and we were given new life, a new life of righteousness in Christ. Jesus Christ brought us out of darkness and brought us into illumination. He brought us into light. Now here's the deal, and I want you to hear me real close this morning. Go with me here for a second. I'm talking to Christians while we were delivered from the world, we still 
possess this deep familiarity with the world and its ways. There's still a part of us, let's just be honest here, let's don't play church, let's just be honest, there's just still a part of us, this fleshly part, that still desires the things of the world that supposedly we left behind when we were saved. There's this sin nature, there's this gray area in our lives, isn't there? And, and I'm talking, and I'm just going to be real honest here, let's just be straight up, it's things like, and this is what believers think, Okay? And I'm just giving some examples, and it, it, it runs the gamut of things that, we, that people struggle with. But here's the thought process as believers. We say, well, I can dabble in it. It's just pornography. Or I can tell little white lies to kind of get ahead in the world. There's a lot worse things. Or I can be unfaithful in my marriage because... God understands because I, I want to be happy. I, I, I know I took on the responsibility of being a parent. I did what it takes to have a child, but I don't have to really be responsible. I can cut corners at work. Nobody will ever know. I, I can be lazy because that's just, that's the way America is. Thank you. And it's that lukewarm state of living, and it's an ongoing battle. And beyond our own sinful desires like those, there's this ongoing pressure from the world around us to be like the world, right? So not only does it come from us, but it comes from the world. Think about it. There's this overt pressure from the world to be like the world rather than to be like Christ. Think about all the advertising and the entertainment and the other forms of media that pushes us to do what the world does. And, and get this, there is even pressure from people who would like for us, and sometimes it's even people that we love and who love us, who would like to see us behave a little bit more like them rather than to be more like Christ. They'd like for us to begin to do the things that they do and people do this because it makes them feel less guilty, go here with me, about the way that they are living, right? And let's just be honest. Like I said, there's this sin nature. This part of us that craves sin, despises the rigors of discipline and growing in holiness to be more like Christ. Because if you're going to grow and be more like Christ, it takes discipline. You got to choose every day who you're going to follow. You got to choose every day, am I going to spend time in God's word? You got to choose every day, am I going to be a person of prayer? You got to choose every day when I make my decisions, am I going to honor Christ? Am I going to not to WWJD you, but to WWJD you? What would Jesus do? You don't have to wear a bracelet to do that. And then we never need to discount the fact that we are at war. There is a great enemy out there. Satan is very real. And he loves to see believers be idle and indifferent and not growing and dabbling in sin because we become very ineffective for the kingdom of God. So what I'm trying to say is that there's all this pressure to go back and be more like the world, to not grow in our faith, to not desire to be more and more like Christ. And while there's this pressure to go back, and here's where I'm going with this this morning, I want you to listen to me. There's also a very clear command from God's Word for us to go forward. It comes from Christ just as surely as the flesh and the world and Satan long for us to conform to ungodly ways, sure as shooting the Spirit of God and the resurrected, changed, enlightened, saved Spirit that is within us as believers should increasingly desire to grow and be more like Christ. You there with me, church? To walk in the light. So that we might be what God really saved us to be. And, and that's why Paul wrote similar things in all these letters that he wrote. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, look at what he said. He said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, Holy and acceptable to who? To God, which is your spiritual worship. Do you know that's what worship is? Worship is not three songs and a sermon on Sunday, but worship is a spiritual act that we do to God 
for God on a daily basis. Do not be conformed to this world, it says, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by the testing that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Look at what Paul said to the church at Galatia. He said this in Galatians 5.17. He said, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. It's a war. It's raging. Which way are we going to go? And here's what I'm getting at with this today. We live in a hard, dark world, a world that's dominated and driven by sin. In the midst of darkness and depravity, here's the awesome thing. God has redeemed a people, hasn't he? He has redeemed a people that he expects to be different because we are different. He's redeemed a people that he is empowered to be different. I'm talking about saved people. If you're redeemed and you're sitting in this room this morning, then know this, you're not a child of darkness anymore. We are children of light. If you're a Christian and you're sitting in here this morning, then you are saved and you are redeemed and you're different. And if you're not a Christian this morning and you're saying, well, you know, I'm 37 or I'm 16 and I'm 53, I'm a student, I'm a business owner, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, but you don't know Jesus Christ, then you're still in the dark, you're lost, and no hope will ever be found until you come to Jesus Christ. Until you call upon him to save you. Bottom line, let's countrify this one. You just need the light turned on, brother. And Jesus is the only one who can flip the switch. The scripture we're looking at today is Paul talking about what it means to be children of the light. Barna Research reports that 77% of people agree that the church is losing its influence in the United States of America. And in many respects, I don't, you know, Bar Barna's not the Bible, okay? But in many respects, I think we have. And could a major factor of the church losing its influence in America be because Christians have neglected our responsibility to be light to the world? As we've neglected what God has called us to be, the world has decided to ignore us. I read a quote. It's an old quote from G. Campbell Morgan. And he said that during the great Christian movement in America, that the church, get this, hashtag this, the church did the most for the world when the church was least like the world. Do you hear that? We live in a day of compromise where the church is trying to blend with the world and be like the world because we want to reach them. Here again, G. Campbell Morgan is not Jesus Christ, but I think he's right on. He said the church did the most for the world when the church was least like the world because the church was something real to look at. When Paul wrote to this young church in Ephesus, he knew that these believers, these followers of Christ... That they were living, get this, and I, we're going to spend a little time here, about ten more minutes, and I want you to get it. They were living as an island of light in a city, in the city of Ephesus, which was filled with darkness. If you, know, if you ever study this, this is interesting. Let's dig in here for a second. Ephesus was bad, 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 bad. It, it was like the Las Vegas of that time, but it made Las Vegas look like nothing. It was worse in many ways. Ephesus was an epicenter of sexual sin, horrific sexual sin. It was mixed, and, and the reason it was even worse than my, what you might think is because the sexual sin was mixed with religion. It, it wasn't just flaunted, it was done in the name of religion and spirituality. In Ephesus, sexual idol worship was infamous. Ephesus was home to the world famous. It's one of the seven wonders of the old world, the Temple of Artemis, or often called the Temple of Diana. And Paul knew that he's, he was telling these Christians in Ephesus, let your light shine into the darkness, that there was real darkness in the place where they lived. So let's just look at these verses, going into it with that understanding. Real quick this morning, let's just let's break it down. It's hammer time, okay? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. I want you to notice as we begin to look through this, look at what the light does. I want you to notice, first of all, that the light, if you're taking notes, the light transforms. 
Look at verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now, that's transformation. The light transforms. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Here is the beautiful picture of conversion with Christ. Jesus Christ transforms. Coming to Christ is like walking from the darkness into a room filled with light. When you have light, you begin to see things that you never saw before. When you lived in the darkness, you did whatever you wanted to do, didn't you? But now that you're in the light, you have to begin to put off the deeds of darkness, put on a lifestyle that's fitting for the children of light because they can be seen now. Verse 9 spells it out for us. Look at verse 9. It says, For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. That's how we're supposed to be living, believers. We're supposed to be living out what is good and right and true. Goodness touches on how we deal with others because we're saved. We can be good to others because Christ has been good to us. Righteousness involves a commitment to obeying Christ's commands. The Scripture tells us that we can have a deep commitment to integrity. That's what truth is. It should all be different now for someone who's saved, and we should be growing in these things. We now have a new goal in life, don't we? We should desire and long for God's ways. We should long to do the things of God. And here's the thing, believers, and we should hate it when we don't. When we fall short, there should be a genuine, repentant spirit that is evident of growing, changing people. Because It's not that we're going to be perfect, but when we fall short, a true believer ought to be repentant and ashamed and want to be more like Christ. Look at verse 10. Look at what Paul says. He says, Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Or in other words, find out what God wants you to do and begin to do it. It kind of means if you're a Christian, then no longer can you say, well, if it feels good, I'll just do it. Or no longer can you say, but everyone else is doing it. No longer can you say, well, I don't care what others think. No longer can you say, I'm going to do what makes me happy. If we truly want to please the Lord, we'll start doing what His Word says, whether it makes us happy or not. We'll stop asking I'm gonna, you know, what pleases me, and we'll begin to say, what pleases the Lord? What pleases you, Lord? We're no longer free agents, are we? No longer making up our moral choices as we go along. Here's the awesome thing about being a Christian. Christians believe something stupendous that the world does not understand at all. We believe that there's a God in heaven who has spoken, that His word is authoritative, that He has the absolute, absolute right to determine our moral choices, doesn't He? He's God. We're not. We don't make the rules, do we? And that, that it covers what we say, what we eat and drink, who we have sex with, how we conduct our business affairs, how we spend our money, all the choices we make in life. And here's the thing. The world finds that strange, doesn't it? Remember, we're foreigners and aliens. Don't forget it. The, the world finds it mysterious. They, they find Christi, Christianity sometimes to be very different. You know, when it comes to things like who we sleep with, we, we believe that God's spoken very clearly. I'm just picking a, picking a sin here. God, God's spoken very clearly about sexuality, hasn't He? That's why believers that believe one man, one woman. That's why believers believe that homosexuality is wrong. That, that's why we can't support gay marriage, because there's no such thing doesn't exist in the eyes of God. The government can pass whatever laws it wishes, but no presidential bill and no act of Congress or edict from the Supreme Court can overturn what holy God has decreed. <laughs> marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman. There's no such thing as gay marriage. God made male and female. Transgender is a man-made thing. And I'm just giving you one example. How we live sexually is just one example of how we live out our lives. It intercedes into every area of our lives. God has a way, and His way is right in every area of life. Because He's God. To be a child of light means that you begin to pray this way. Lord, show me how I can please you today. Nothing in my living matters as much as this. I truly want to please you, Lord. I want to do it your way. It has to be our desire. Because we're transformed. Light transformed. Now look at verses 8 through 10. We're moving quick now. 
Light not only transforms, but light exposes. That's what Paul says here. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Now remember, here, remember, what, remember the context. Paul, I mentioned it earlier. Paul was dealing with Ephesus, home of the temple of Artemis, temple of Diana, seven, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it drew worshipers, worshipers and tourists from all over. Temple rituals were here, held there. And in the temple, now this was not a Christian place, okay? This was, this was idol worship. But in that temple, it, they, it included cultic prostitution. And so when Paul talks of the things done in secret, he means a vile form of evil that goes beyond just ordinary acts of rebellion. It, it describes a, a gross, unnatural, perverted thing done in the name of spirituality. And you, but here's what's interesting. Did you know that as Christianity grew in Ephesus as the church became real and viable and people began to live out their faith, do you know what happened to the temple of Artemis? Temple of Diana? It shut down. It shut down. The believers wouldn't have it. Christians can change things, folks. The light of the gospel exposes evil for what it really is. If you're going to buy an expensive diamond, you're going to view it in the best possible light, aren't you? Before you make that purchase, because light exposes the flaws in the stone. Shadows hide the flaws, but light reveals all of them. So similarly, I'm using that example. Go with me here for a second. When the gospel enters a family, hidden secrets will be revealed. When the gospel invades a community, corruption comes to light. When the gospel's at the center of a marriage, then you be find a marriage that's not perfect but starts to become healthy. When the gospel's in the workplace, the workplace may not easy, be easy, but the workplace is better. Let me say it like this. The world doesn't want the light, but it desperately needs the light. The world needs us to be the church. We have the light that shines and exposes Let's go here for a second, but we need to be real careful while we do it. That's also scriptural. Paul said to the Galatian church, something we need to remember. He said, brothers, if anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But he also said, keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. So you've got to be grounded. As you go and start to shed the light, you've got to be grounded. Because if you're not, then you're going to be tempted to say, oh, well, maybe I can live a little bit like the world. Our, our zeal to help the hurting, sometimes we ignore the last phrase and the, the, where it says, lest you be tempted. But never forget, Satan's tricky. He knows if he can get one person trapped in sin, he may soon get another, and then another, and then another. We've got a couple of doctors in here. That's why doctors wash their hands so often. Not only must they avoid giving germs to the patients, but they guard themselves from receiving germs from the patients. You're like, that guy washes his hands a lot. There's a reason for it. In our attempts to help others, we must be careful lest we start making excuses, offering rationalizations, avoiding confrontation, letting sympathy replace the truth. Remember, in the world, but not of it, right? Helping, but not falling into the same sins. And verse 13 describes the result of exposing dark things with the light of Christ. Paul says that something really cool begins to happen. Look at verse 13. It says, But when anything's exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Light exposes the true character of everything. It's not hard to understand that principle. When a little child cries because it's dark in the room, mom comes in, turns on the light, the tears quickly vanish. When the child can see that see mom and see things, he realizes that he doesn't have a reason to be afraid, that the monsters were just in his imagination, right? Apply it to the spiritual realm. Here we go again. Let's use the example of sexual sin. The list of sins is exhausting, but I picked this one out today. Sexual sin is often justified by people because it's done in secret, because it's done in the dark. But let those emails and those text messages be made public. Suddenly the romance begins to fade because light reveals the truth. Let it be viewed on the internet and found out 
that somebody's been looking at, get caught in the affair, when the light shines on the darkness, uh uh-oh, it all comes crashing down. But God has a better way. I read a quote that says, you're only as sick as your secrets. You can't get better until you begin to tell the truth about yourself. As long as you live a double life, one foot in the light and one foot in the darkness, you'll forever, get this, be torn, double-minded and unhealthy because your heart is divided. God doesn't want half your heart. And look, this room is full of people, myself included, who have fallen short in all areas of sin. And we did it before we were saved. And we were saved and redeemed by Christ. And we have dabbled in it and we've lived in it. And sometimes we have been pulled back to lukewarmness and we have been, we've been duped into thinking we can still be like the world and still pay allegiance to Christ. But eventually we realize it doesn't work that way. And some of you have walked through some of those things and God's forgiven you and people have forgiven you. And I'm just going to say keep marching on, keep walking with Christ because God's a redeemer. God loves you and God can still use you. Some of you may be walking in it right now and you need to get out of it. You need to let light be shined on it. You need to come out of the darkness and let it be exposed. You're like, it'll ruin my rep. Uh, Don't let it ruin your eternity. I wouldn't worry about your rep so much. I'd get right with God because God's got a better plan. God's got a better plan. You know, and our job's not to judge. Our job as believers is to shine light. God's the judge. Let's just preach and teach and share God's word. Be honest with people. And listen, here's the, here's the, here's the bottom line. This is kind of what I wanted to get to. I always like to get to a bottom line. The truth is going to hurt us sometimes. It's going to hurt to deal with the truth. It's better on the other side. When you start walking with Christ. This is my own sentence. I made this up. Truth will hurt you before it heals you. Truth will hurt you before it heals you. I told you we'd go here. Listen listen to David. Listen to David in Psalm 51. This was when the truth was revealed and it hurt him. Nathan came to David and David couldn't believe what Nathan was telling him. And then Nathan looked him in the eye and he said, I'm talking about you. And And David said things in Psalm 51. He said things like, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He's the one that said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin did my mother conceive me. He's the one that said, Lord, I'm so dirty. He said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. That's David said all those things in Psalm 51. But in verse 8, it's, it's the epitome of how how sometimes we have to hurt before we're healed. The, the hurting comes with the healing. In Psalm 51, verse 8, David said, Let me hear joy and gladness. And he said, Let the bones that you have broken, some versions say crushed. Let the bones you have crushed, the bones you have broken, let them rejoice. Truth will hurt before it heals you. Think about this cool concept, Okay. Darkness can only produce more darkness. If you add dark to dark, what do you get? Yeah, it's just darkness. But light can change the darkness. You shed, you, you turn on, you flip a switch, you put light in the darkness, it changes it, right? Remember the last part of verse thing? Anything exposed by the light becomes visible. When God turns the light on, the darkness is gone forever. The first part of verse 14 says anything that becomes visible is light. Here's the last thing. Write this down. It's the last thing to write down, and then we're done. So light transforms and light exposes, but number three is light awakens. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's just about as good as John 3, 16. Paul had already said in Ephesians chapter 2, he said, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So how can, a, how, can a, how can a dead man rise from the dead? Isn't that like walking into a corpse at the funeral home and saying, stand up? Dead people can't come back to life on their own, but Jesus can raise dead men to life. 
That's conversion. That's salvation. That's new birth. That's a lot, the life-transforming power. There is power in this. That's the life-transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen. We're in a world of opportunity. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, the opportunity is right before you. Today is the day of salvation. You still have a chance. Come to Christ this morning. He'll save you. We're in a world of opportunity because at no time does the church have more of an opportunity to reach a lost world because America is getting more and more lost. Opportunity to shed light into the darkness. I don't know if y'all realize it, but it's happening right now. Every fifth Sunday, this is the fifth Sunday, but every fifth Sunday we have here at the church, we have a guy here in our church that goes over with our kids, and they call it Salvation Sunday. They're, they're here, they've been hearing, that's why I'm preaching long today. They're just hearing the gospel over there and hearing what it means to be saved. That's shedding light. Let's sing one more song and we'll go. Let's go knock some holes in the darkness this week, church. Let's do it. Let's go knock some holes in the darkness. As these guys come up here, I just want to remind you of what God's Word says. Matthew chapter 5. Reading the Scripture and the Lord brought me, uh, the Lord brought me along to this Scripture. And we preached on this a while back. Jesus was, this is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was preaching and he was saying, blessed are you if you do this, blessed are you if you do this, and I will do this. He's, he's making these promises. And then Jesus reminds them after he says, he's talking to believers, and Jesus reminds them and he says, in Matthew chapter 5, verse, well, I'll go back to verse 13. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if salt's lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And then verse 14 says, you, this is speaking to believers, he says, you are what? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp, put a, put a, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father, who is in heaven. How we live matters. How we live matters. Let's stand and let's sing with them. We're going to close out with a song. If you don't know Christ this morning, come run and just come and say, look, I don't know Jesus. Tell me how. If you're a believer and you need to just come and pray, come and do that. Whatever God needs to do with us, let's let God do it, okay?